Well, good morning, church. And merry day after Christmas, everyone. Hey, this morning I'm going to be preaching from the Gospel of John, uh, John chapter 10. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, uh, we have some in the back of each pew, and I'll even tell you the page number. Page 870 is where John 10 is. Yeah, I looked ahead just to make sure you could get there. And if you don't own a Bible, if you don't own a Bible, please take one of these with you. That is our post-Christmas gift to you, to have that. All right, let me do a little family check-in to start out with. Did you have a good Christmas? Was Santa Claus good to you? Now, I'll tell you that there, Saint Nicholas, who was a bishop back in the fourth century, there's actually a, a, an urban myth that he got punched in the face, but uh, I can't talk about that. It's really going to take us down a road. Never mind. Ask me afterwards. Were your parents good to you? Yes. yes. Excellent. Was your spouse good to you? Yeah? Was the Lord good to you? Yeah. All right. Now, your answers to these questions, I'll tell you, they're very subjective. They state what you feel about how Christmas was or about how your parents treated you or the Lord being good to you. Um, and they state really what you think. Yes, I think I had a very good Christmas. Yes, I think that things were good in my home this, this Christmas. All very subjective. But this morning, we're going to look at a statement in Scripture using the word good that's not subjective. And so we'll get there. Uh, it occurs twice in the passage we're going to go through, not subjective at all. We'll look at that in just a minute. But first of all, for a context, I want to take you back the last four sermons and show you where we've been going in this series on the I Am's. Through this Christmas season, we've been celebrating the Savior's birth and learning more about how to worship him and uh, with some help from his, one of his 12 disciples, John. John wrote this gospel so that he could demonstrate what he saw. It generally operated from a view that he had after he'd walked with this man who really was God the Son in human flesh. He was truly God and truly man. And John not only wanted this gospel to be heard so that you could believe in Christ, the readers of this, and have life in his name, but so you'd also know something spectacular about this man. He truly is God in the flesh. And John shows us this by recollecting seven different things about Jesus, seven I am's tied to a metaphor, each one of them displaying that he is truly God. And each one is, and by the way, the I am in the Greek of that day, is ego eimi. And ego eimi reflected something that God said about himself back in the Old Testament. So Jesus, by introducing each of these statements with ego eimi, is saying, I am God. I'm God the Son. And it's spectacular when you read these and know that. And each one of these I am's is followed by a personal qualification about who Jesus is and what he came to do. And so we've looked at four of these over the past four weeks. Ego e me, I am the bread of life. Ego e me, I am the light of the world. Ego e me, I am the door. Ego e me, I am the resurrection and the life. And in each one of these, actually the gospel is being preached because Jesus, as he does these in the context, is calling people to believe in his name and have life in his name. And so it's calling hearers, not only the hearers that John wrote to, and the hearers of that original office, or that original context that day, but it's also for us, for you and for me to hear these I am's, and if we don't know Christ, to know him. And if we do know Christ, to know more about him, to believe in who he is and what he came to do. And so today, John chapter 10, 
We're going to look at this declaration Jesus makes about himself. I am the good shepherd. Listen to this for this word as we read this passage. I'm going to read it to you right now. So we're going to start in John 10 verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who's not a shepherd and does not own sheep sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and runs away. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. Because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep, he runs away. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And here it is again, I lay down my life for my sheep. I have other sheep that don't come from this sheepfold. I must bring them too. And they will listen to my voice so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down of my own free will. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. So three things, at least three, that I want us to understand from this passage. And here's the first one. The good shepherd was sent by the Father in that day and even today. The metaphor Jesus uses, this shepherd metaphor, is very intentional. The word shepherd immediately brought to mind a person whose job it was to watch over the sheep, a flock of sheep. And sheep needed care, needed direction to water and to food, needed shearing of their wool, and needed protection from predators. The current president of Dallas Theological Seminary, Mark Yarborough, back in his younger days, actually functioned as a shepherd. And in a devotional he wrote for this Christmas, he says this, over 30 years ago, I would drive a worn out white Chevy pickup and park it in the middle of the 3,200 3, acre ranch where I was privileged to work. Opening and closing the stiff door, creaky door, I would walk in front of the vehicle and yell, you, you. Then I'd wait. Within a minute, a distant rumbling was noticeable. Eventually, arriving at the truck, through the crashing trees on pounding hooves were th about 300 sheep. Yarbrough describes how the sheep were cared for, that he cared for were dumb as a brick. Now, there's professional shepherds that absolutely disagree with that assessment, but that's what he saw. And they could not provide for themselves, needed constant protection from the enemy. I was a modern day shepherd when I worked the ranch, he wrote. During lambing season, I would periodically camp outside with the flock to protect them from the enemy. Coyotes were always a present danger. On occasion, I would build a fire through the night and the flock would gather around and graze in my presence. It was a banquet of sorts that occurred throughout the evening, even as the eyes of the enemy glistened from the firelight in the night. My rifle was there to protect and defend the sheep if necessary. When they were with me, they had everything they needed. But Jesus, even using this metaphor, isn't talking about a literal shepherd like that. And, uh, Jesus declared himself to be a shepherd because God's people were spiritually like a flock of sheep. Yes, they needed care, they needed healing, uh, and Jesus did some of those things when he was with them. But when you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus was doing that, but really, the people needed to have, most of all, a right relationship with God. That's the shepherd he intended to be for them. He was for them. But what about this word good? Good shepherd. Why does Jesus not just simply say, I am the shepherd, but he says, I'm the good shepherd? Well, good's not a subjective description about Jesus. It's who he truly is. Good is who he is because the people needed a good shepherd. Let me put it really simply for you. In that day, there were bad shepherds. 
that claim to be representing God's name. So let me read these three verses about that real quickly again. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who's not a shepherd and doesn't own sheep sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and runs away. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. Because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep, he runs away. These hired hands were bad shepherds. They only cared for themselves. Now, you may know people like that. People in leadership or bosses or teachers or even friends whose relationship with you is really based upon what they can profit from it. Not based on loyalty and love and friendship. When things get difficult, and by the way, that's the exact moment where, where a shepherd is really needed, they flee, they'll ditch you, they'll throw you under the bus, they'll jump ship, because their true colors are revealed when things get difficult in the face of self-survival or self-advancement. Jesus is talking about the religious leaders of his day. Those were the bad shepherds. He's using that same metaphor that God used to denounce priests of the Old Testament. Because you see, there's a history of God's people of bad shepherds. So we go back several hundred years to the book of Ezekiel, and we see something about this long history of bad shepherds. Here's Ezekiel 34, 5. He describes his people, they were scattered for the lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast in field and were scattered. My flock, God says, through Ezekiel, wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. And there was no one to search after or seek them. No one. Well, he had religious leaders in that day. He had priests. And he had those who were supposed to do this for the flock, care for them. Here's what he says. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord as I live declares the Lord God, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field and for lack of a shepherd. And my shepherds didn't search for the flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves rather than feed my flock. He was saying the same thing Jesus was. The shepherds weren't caring for the sheep The shepherds in that day weren't caring for the relationship with God. They only cared about themselves. And Jesus knew this was still true in his day, several hundred years later. And the gospels give evidence of this. So both in Matthew and Mark, he talks about the condition of the sheep. He writes this, um, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease, And every kind of sickness, that's what Jesus did. And people followed him because of those things. But he was looking at their spiritual condition, and and this is what it said about what he saw. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Same condition as back in Ezekiel's day. Why Why were the people like this? Why were they dispirited? Well, because they weren't shepherded. The religious leaders should have heard Jesus' voice. They should have recognized him as the Messiah. They should have been so glad about that. And they should have submitted themselves to him. He's here. We have a shepherd. But they did the opposite. And we see that throughout the Gospels. They didn't recognize him as the Messiah. They were threatened by him. They opposed him. They challenged him, despised him, and finally plotted even to kill him. But the father promised back in Ezekiel's day that he would rescue his sheep. He would save his sheep. Here's what Ezekiel says. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, So I will care for my sheep and I will deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick. But 
the fat and strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. And that's what a shepherd does too. Doesn't let those who don't belong to the flock in. This was Jesus Christ's ministry. The incarnation and the life of the Son of God was the fulfillment of the prophecy God made in Ezekiel. So when he announces, I am the good shepherd, echoing me, good shepherd, that means the shepherd is here, the one that God promised to his people. God the Father sent God the Son, and he was, and he is, the good shepherd. And he's been healing, and he's been feeding, and he's been calling his flock then and now, but there's more. There's more in the scripture that defines what kind of a shepherd he was. One is the good shepherd knows his sheep, which by the way includes you, those of his flock. Here's verse 14. Listen, as he reiterates this metaphor, but gives a deeper meaning. Listen, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for my sheep there again. Here's uh, something from uh, modern day, current day shepherd, Craig Rogers. He's from Border Springs Farm in Patrick Springs, Virginia. And he wrote this, was that a clap for Virginia? Oh, never mind. Uh, 10 things I've learned about lambs. This is in Modern Farmer. So the first of the 10 things he noticed is that shepherds know their sheep. Shepherds, like sheep themselves, learn quickly that the path to success as a shepherd depends on tending to the flock, but caring for the individual. Providing clean water, ample forage, and shelter to an entire flock is essential to maintaining the health of the flock. Now, Craig Rogers also writes this, which might be a little disturbing, so be careful. He closes his article with this. There's no better way to start a conversation about the joy and value of farming than with a lamb on a spit. Here's the shepherd caring for his flock and he's talking about this. There's no better way to celebrate the life of a shepherd than sharing a lamb cooked over on a spit. Well, I guarantee you, Jesus isn't frying or or turning his sheep over a barbecue pit or an open, open flame somewhere, not happening. But here, Roger sounds much like Jesus. The success of a shepherd or shepherdess is the compassion they have for each individual. This means being able to identify a sick or injured sheep or lamb, listen, within a flock of hundreds or thousands of sheep. Can you imagine a thousand sheep and you know them individually? Here's what Jesus said. I know my own and my own know me. He knows his followers, and his followers, because they hear his voice, should come to know him more and more every day. He knows every flock, not just every sheep, but every, think about the millions of people who come to Christ over the centuries. He knew them all personally. He knew and knows every single church. He knows FBC Bernie. He knows churches around the San Antonio area and burning area. He knows churches in Dallas. He knows churches across the U.S. He knows churches around the world. Think about that. God the Son, the good shepherd, knows every sheep in his flock and knows every flock of his sheep. Isn't that incredible to think about? Just like God the Father and God the Son know each other, and how do they know each other? They've got an eternal, unbreakable bond. They've known each other. God the Son and God the Father are all eternity. Jesus says, just like my Father, just as I know the Father and the Father knows me, so too I know my flock. (coughs) And we can know him more and more and more. And others can see him because of us. In John's Gospel, Jesus says that. They said, that others will know my disciples, he's thinking about the time when he's not gonna be with them anymore, by their love for one another. How do we do that? Because we know our savior more. We know how much he loves us individually and as a flock. And from that, our desire should be 
love one another so others will see him, see the shepherd through his flock. The good shepherd knows you. The good shepherd knows everything about you. He does. Every moment of every day, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're thinking, no matter what you're saying, he knows you. That's a kind of a, a, sometimes a difficult thought. Oh my gosh, he sees me all the time. But it's also a comforting thought. He knows your every need all the time. Then in verse 16, I have other sheep that don't come from the sheepfold. I must bring them too, and they will listen to my voice. So that there'll be one flock and one shepherd. The sheepfold he's talking about then was the Jewish people that he was preaching to, the folks in Jerusalem and, and around that area, the, the Jews. But he's thinking as he's saying this about those who will hear after he's gone. So then in Acts 1, he tells his disciples, I'm going away, but you're going. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Because his sheepfold is bigger than just the Jews of his day. His sheepfold would be the whole world. Think about that. Other sheep, and we see how the gospel of Jesus has gone around the world. But only his sheep would hear his voice, he says. For nearly 2,000 years, he's been calling. Calling his sheep through the proclamation of the gospel. And guess what? Nothing in this world can stop that. Absolutely nothing. Whatever you're worried about today, whatever you're thinking about, oh my gosh, the church is under such duress from the world. The shepherd continues to proclaim the gospel through us. And those who hear his voice and know him, they come. They come. Don't forget that. And though there's been thousands of churches around the world throughout the centuries, remember there's only one shepherd, right? We all have the same shepherd. And the good shepherd for centuries has demonstrated how he cares for his flock. I am the good shepherd. But listen, listen, this is what I really want you to hear today. This is so important about what the shepherd says about his laying down his life. The good shepherd's calling you because he's laid down his life for you. Verse 17, this is why the father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it back again. No one takes it from me. Think about that. Typical shepherd, concerned about a predator, Jesus says, no one can take my life, but I lay it down in my own free will. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it back again. This commandment I received from my father. Before, we talked about a typical shepherd, the real kind of shepherd, and they defend the sheep from predators. They protect the sheep that way. Now, Jesus adds something distinct. He actually lays down his life not to protect his sheep, but to save his sheep. Let's be very real here. You and I are sinners. We are. We're born in sin. And we live and practice that sin. And because of that, we were all separated from the Father. We were dead in our sins before we came to know Christ. We were dead in our sins. We weren't alive waiting for a predator to care for us. We're dead, spiritually dead. No rights to be in his pasture. No rights to go through that door. But Jesus Christ, God the Son, the good shepherd came and laid down his life for us. And here's how he did it. Willingly. Out of loving obedience to the Father. Because this is why the Father sent him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Out of, out of obedience, loving obedience to the Father. With the most extreme sacrifice that could ever be made for his sheep. Went to suffer an excruciating death on a cross. Willingly, he knew that's where he was going. It wasn't a surprise, like, oh, the wolf's in the, in the... He willingly knew where he was going, and he went there. So when he says here twice, the good shepherd lays down his life for sheep, I lay down my life for my sheep. That's what he's talking about. 
at the hands of false shepherds, the wolves who engineered that, he went to the cross taking on all our sins. The shepherd gave his life so that we might have life. I lay it down in my own free will, he said, and he did for us. I take it back again, and he did. He was resurrected so that we might have the hope that he promised of eternal life. It gets very clear when, when, uh, uh, when he talks a little bit later we didn't read this passage, but I'm going to take you to it. Because as soon as Jesus finishes talking about his being a good shepherd, he talks about a sharp division broke out among the Jews. So you've got the, <laughs> the ones who are called by his voice and the ones who are, are rejecting his voice, and they're arguing about him. And Jesus says, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they testify of me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, that which God the Father said he was doing in sending his son. I give eternal life to him. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. You were in the flock of the good shepherd forever, for all eternity, the moment you respond when he calls your voice. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. I and the Father are one. Isn't that incredible? This good shepherd laid down his life willingly, knowingly for you and for me. And all that's required of the sheep, all that's required is to hear his voice. And by confessing our sin and our belief in the good shepherd, we will have life in his name. We'll enter his pasture. We'll be in his kingdom. This is how we enter the gate. This is how we recognize his voice. Praise the Lord. Today, we witness the baptisms of six individuals. Oh my goodness. Quinn and Ryan and Alex and Anna and Melody and Rylan heard the voice of their shepherd. Amen. Confess their sins have life in his name, and we publicly got to see it. Isn't that incredible? On the day after we celebrate the birth of the Lord, we got to see that. And the good shepherd continues to call, even today. Let me give you one more little nugget here. So I know I'm probably over time. Sorry about that, Mark, but we're going to keep going for just another couple minutes if you're okay with that. The bonus. The good shepherd has given the church pastors to shepherd his flock. See, Jesus ascended, that's an Acts. he ascended and we're waiting for him to come back. He's coming back someday, we don't know when, but guess what? He is still shepherding his flock. He's still actively shepherding his flock. It's not like he said, okay guys, you take over, I'm done, I'll see you later, but actively. You need to know he's coming back for his flock. He's not stopped shepherding. And he's given the flock a great gift. He's given his flocks pastors and leaders who are his under shepherds. In John 21, we see this in John's gospel because at the end, he reconciles Peter who, who denied him and he tells Peter, shepherd my sheep. And that set the pattern for what was gonna happen in every church that was planted by the apostles and continue to be planted up until today. In the book of Acts, we, we read where Paul talks to the elders of Ephesians as he's leaving, and he's concerned because Paul's heading off to imprisonment and probably death, and he's telling these elders of the church at Ephesus that Paul planted, hey, you need to shepherd the flock, because he says this, shepherd the church of God, which Christ purchased with his own blood. I know that savage wolves will come in among you. Paul used that same metaphor not sparing the flock. And even among yourselves, some may rise to do this. Well, here at First Baptist Bernie, you should know, especially if you're a guest here, haven't been here long, our pastors are committed to listen to the voice of the shepherd, to disciple you faithfully. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad that we have Daniel Justice here as our discipleship pastor. Jason Smith is our, our lead pastor. Amen. To watch for the dangers and warn you 
and continually, continually proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, hoping and praying as they do it. I mean, we are committed to preaching the gospel so that you may, if you haven't yet, hear his voice. Amen. And if you know him, that you may know him more and more and more. And that you may seek to listen to your shepherd and go where he takes you. Serve him well. Remember what he's done for you. And introduce others to him. Because the world needs to hear from the good shepherd. They need to know the Lord Jesus Christ more than anything else, more than that best present that you got yesterday. They need Jesus, the good shepherd. And if you've never heard his voice and come through the gate that he opens for you, we hope and we pray that you will. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for our good shepherd. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving your life for us. The perfect plan of your father. Lord, may we continue to listen to your voice. May we seek to know you more. You know everything about us. And Father, may you continue to shepherd this church. Jesus, shepherd this church so that we may be faithful to the gospel. Today, tomorrow, next week, until he comes. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.